Scripture reading is taken from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Anybody, been, anybody uh, got eaten up by mosquitoes yet? All right, you're going to see a couple probably flying around me. For some reason, they are loving me today. I was up here this morning going over my lesson, and they were just swarming me up here. So if you see me clapping, I'm trying to kill a mosquito. Acts chapter 12, if you've got your Bibles with you today, Acts chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4 here in just a few seconds as we continue our series on prayer. Appreciate Ricky reading that for me. Paul says, I pray for you, and that's the point I wanted to make. Today we're going to be talking about praying for the church. Look at verses 1 through 4. Notice what it says. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to, see, to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now before I go any further, let me say this. I believe with all my heart that Satan will do everything that he can to hinder the advancement of the kingdom. I believe that. I believe he'll do anything he can to hinder that from keeping us from being who we need to be, from doing what we need to do. I mean, here in chapter 12, there's persecution that's come upon the church. Herod has arrested James, the brother of John, and he has him beheaded. He has him put to death. Then, seeing how much the Jews loved this and appreciated this, he arrests Peter. And I believe with all my heart, he was getting ready to do the exact same thing to Peter. Because Peter was a great evangelist. And, and Peter did great things for the kingdom of God. And, and like I said, I think the kingdom of darkness was at work and, and wanted to see everything just kind of fall apart. And so Peter is arrested and he is getting ready to be tried after the Passover. I think it's kind of interesting that Herod put 16 men to guard him. Don't you think that's a little overkill? 16 men to guard one individual. But you see, here's the thing that Herod did not want. He did not want Peter to escape. There had already been one jailbreak, right? I mean, if you go back to Acts chapter 5, verse 18, the apostles are out, and here again, kingdom of darkness is working. The apostles are out teaching and preaching about Jesus. The religious leaders didn't like it. They had them arrested, but in the middle of the night, God sends an angel, has the apostles freed, and they're back out the next day teaching and preaching in the temple. Which tells me, guess what? Even though Satan gives his best efforts, he cannot hinder the advancement of the kingdom. But here is Peter, and, and he is surrounded by 16 men. Herod said, not on my watch. You know, he is not getting free. He is not, uh, you know, going to escape from prison. But what you're going to see, beginning in verse 6, is that the church began to pray for Peter. Which, let me stop right here and say this. I believe that the church's greatest weapon against the kingdom of darkness is prayer. And the reason I believe that is, it may be God who moves the mountains, but here's the deal. It is prayer that moves God. And so we need to be calling out to God 
to deliver us, to be with us, to help us be who we need to be, to give us the strength to go out and spread the message of Jesus. And so like I said, Peter has been arrested, he is in prison, but the church began to pray. And you know what? Today as a church, we need to pray. But let me say this, we need to pray believing that God can do what we're asking Him to do. Okay? Because I realize that God answers prayers. We've talked about this before. God answers prayers one of three ways. No, that's not good for you. You don't need that. Yes, you know, you can have this, or not right now, maybe later. You're not ready for it right now. But whenever we, need, whenever we pray, we need to pray believing that God can do what we're asking Him to do. It's kind of like the, the story that I heard years ago uh, about a, a little boy who was being questioned by his dad about Sunday school class. He said, son, what would you learn about in, in Sunday school today? And he said, well... And he kind of hesitated, but finally said, well, he said, I learned about Moses and the Red Sea. And his dad said, yeah. He said, what would you learn about Moses and the Red Sea? He said, well, he said, there was this old guy by the name of Israel, and he had a bunch of children. And they were taken into slavery by the people of Egypt. Well, along comes Moses, and he tells Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Or some bad things were going to start happening. But Pharaoh didn't listen to him and bad things started happening until finally Pharaoh said, okay, take the children of Israel and leave. And so Moses loaded up all the children of Israel on a bus and he drove them out of Egypt. But then Pharaoh changed his mind. He said, you know what, I didn't want to let them go. And so he sends out his army, all kinds of tanks, Dad, and, and guns, and, and just, you know, this, this huge army, and they're pursuing the children of Israel. Well, the children of Israel, they get to the Red Sea. Now they've got the, the Red Sea at their backs. They've got the Egyptians pursuing. And he says, Dad, you know what they did? The children of Israel took out their barley bags, and they started filling it with sand, and they started sandbagging the Red Sea. And they had this huge water pump and, and they were pumping out the water in between those sandbags until they were able to walk across on dry land. Well, the Egyptians decided they were going to try it too, but he said, Dad, you're not going to believe this. Moses, he was so smart, he lined those sandbags with dynamite. And when they got halfway across the Red Sea, he pushed his detonator on the end of his, of his staff and it blew up the sandbags and all the water rushed in and wiped out all the Egyptians. And his dad just looked at him. And he said, son, he said, is, is that the way your teacher told you the story? And the little boy said, no, dad, he said, but if I tell it the way she did, you wouldn't believe me. And you see, that's the first thing that we've got to come to realize within the Lord's kingdom is we've got to learn to believe in the unbelievable. You know, we grew up, right, hearing stories about a God who was so powerful that He could divide the Red Sea. Who was so powerful that He could make walls fall. Who was so powerful that He could make the lame to walk and the blind to see. But so many times what happens is we start growing up and we begin to lose that childlike faith that we once had in an all-powerful God. We've got to learn to believe in the unbelievable in fact, James says, in James chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, he's talking about our prayers. He says, when you ask, he says, you must believe and not doubt. He says, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he's going to receive anything from the Lord. In other words, what James says is when you pray, you've got to pray believing that God can do what you're asking Him to do. Now, he may not answer that prayer the way you want him to. He may say no. He may say not till later. But you've got to believe. You've got to have the faith that he can do what he says he can do. He is an all-powerful God. But that's hard, right? 
That's hard for us at times to, to believe. And it, it, it's not just hard for us today. You go back to the first century church. And I'm not going to put this reading up on the screen behind me. It's too lengthy. But in verse 6, we see again, Peter's in prison and the church begins to pray earnestly to God for him. For him to be released. And watch this. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. So here he is. He's surrounded by these guards. He's chained up. I mean, Herod thinks, I have got him. He's not going anywhere. But watch God move. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. And a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was only seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards. They came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent this angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. And so here is Peter... He is locked up in this prison cell. The church is over here having a prayer meeting on his behalf and God starts working on behalf of Peter. He sends an angel of the Lord who releases him from his chains, who leads him out of the prison. And man, even Peter himself is kind of struggling believing that it's happening, right? I mean, is this a vision that I'm seeing? And then once he gets out of the prison, it dawns on him, you know what, this is real. This is really happening. God has saved me. He has delivered me from the clutches of, of Herod. Now let's keep reading. Let's see what happens from here. I'm going to put this up on the, the screen behind me. Verses 12 through 16. When this dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called John Mark. So this is John Mark's mother where many people were gathered and were praying. They're having this, this prayer meeting at her house. Peter knocked at the outer entrance. And a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, this is hilarious, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were what? They were astonished. Are you getting this? I mean, here you have Peter. He is, he is locked up in prison. You have the church over here that is praying for Peter to be released. And when God answers their prayer, when Peter is finally knocking on the door, they don't even believe that, that it's him. Surely not. This can't be Peter. Peter's in prison. He's probably dead by now. You know what? It, it's probably Peter's ghost. Right? And it says that they were astonished. You know, if there is one thing that should never describe us as Christians when it comes to God, it's this. Surprise. How often are we surprised when God answers our prayers the way we, we ask Him to? I mean, there are so often, there are so many times, I, I, and, and it's so embarrassing because of all the things that I've seen as a minister, but there are so many times when we will pray about something as a family, and God will answer that prayer the way I've asked Him to, and, and I'll look at Julie and I'll say, I can't believe that. And Julie will look at me and say, why? Why are, you, why are you so surprised? How many of you have ever felt that way before? How, how, many, how many of you have ever prayed for someone to become a Christian and when they finally made the decision, when they finally gave their life to Christ, you were just like, man, I can't believe they came to Christ. 
Or here you've got someone who's been living in sin, and, and you know, you start praying for them to come back. Lord, lead them back to you. And, and for several years, you know, they're living in sin, but then finally, they come back to Christ, and we think to ourselves, man, I can't believe that. Wow, we prayed about it. That's what we were praying for. And so we, we have to be aware, so many times we, we pray, but when we pray, we doubt. And, and we've got to pray believing, because our doubt many times hinders our prayers. Let me say this, we need to pray for the church. That's what this lesson is about. We, we, we definitely need to pray for the church. I, I want to share with you just a... A couple of passages, a couple of scripture from different letters that Paul wrote to the different congregations. The first one's found in Romans chapter 15, verses 30 through 32. He says, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. Now there are two things, notice, that Paul asked the church to pray for. And I think we can learn a lot from this. First of all, he says, as a church, he says, I want you to pray for me. Notice he specifically individualizes himself. I, I, I think this is huge because so many times, and I don't want to see a show of hands, but so many times when we are praying for the church, how many of us just kind of generalize it? How many of us just simply say, Lord, please be with the church? Let me tell you something. I think we need to call out names. There are people we know of right here among our assembly that we know going through some sort of battle, they're suffering in some way, and we need to lift their names before God. Right now, we've got Ken Wyatt, who has fallen. He's broken his elbow. He's having a hard time. He's away from B. Let me tell you something. Ken and B need your prayers. They need healing. They also just need comfort and peace, being apart from each other. He's in a rehab. Right now we have Dennis Stoltz. He's up in our, our balcony, him and Miss Virginia. They've been battling cancer, but Dennis has been dealing with psoriasis. And I, I hope I'm not upsetting you this morning, Dennis, by mentioning this. But you know what? We need to lift his name in prayer. We need to be praying for Dennis Stoltz and Virginia to be healed. And we need to leave that to God's will, but we need to let God know we're serious about this. We love these people. We need to be praying for them. We need to cover them in prayer. It's like in the old days, right, where you had the good guys, you had the bad guys, the cowboys, and, and, and you know one of the good guys would turn to the other good guy and say, listen, cover me, I'm going in. Right? They're, they're having a shootout with the bad guys. Cover me. I'm, I'm, I'm going in. I'm going to take these guys on. And we need to do the same thing as Christians. We need to cover each other in prayer. We need to be praying that physically, for a lot of these, these needs, we have a lot of spiritual needs that we need to pray over. And I think a lot of us, we know what those spiritual needs are. We know of some individuals that are struggling in their marriage. We need to lift their names before God. We know some individuals that are struggling financially. We need to mention their names before God. Well, Slade, I don't have time. I'm too busy. Well, let me tell you something. God may be too busy to answer those prayers. We need to take the time to pray for each other. And that's what Paul is asking for. He says, pray for me. But then something else he prays for or asks the church to pray for is effectiveness. He says, listen, I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem and I, I'm asking you to pray that when I get there, I will be effective. And we need to be praying that for each other. That as we go out and do life, 
among people who are in this dark world and living in darkness, we need to be praying as, as we do life that we will be effective. When we go off to work, when we go off to school, when we're out here in the community and we're playing sports, when we go to a restaurant, when we're in the grocery store, we need to go ahead and, and plow the way, right, with prayer, asking God, Lord, help me to be effective today. Help me to make a difference in my community. Then we go on to Colossians chapter 4. This is just a, another, another letter that Paul wrote. And he gives us two more things that he wants the church to pray about and really tells us two things about God as well. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and be thankful. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ which I am in chains. Pray that I will proclaim it clearly as I should. Notice Paul says, I need you to pray two more things. And really, these are two things that we can learn about God. First of all, God has something to do with the opportunity. We need to pray to God for the opportunity as a church to tell someone about Jesus. To invite someone to services. You know, each and every day, we are given opportunities. We pass people at work. We see people in the grocery store. We talk to family on the phone. And, and we need to pray, God, help me to be effective among these people. But God, give me the opportunity. Help the conversation to set just right. You know, help, help make a way for me to invite them to study the Bible with them. But God, please give us as a church family the opportunity to tell people, to witness to people in our community. But then something else we learn about God is God has something to do with the clarity of the message. Notice, pray, notice what Paul says. He says, pray that I may proclaim this message that he's carrying, that I will proclaim it clearly. How many of you have ever been talking to someone about Christ or sharing your faith with someone and them, I mean, you can just look at them, they're lost. They don't know what in the world you're talking about. I mean, you have totally confused them. And I mean, even the Apostle Paul, you remember what Peter said about Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16? He says, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Let me tell you, if there, there are some things that Paul says that are hard to understand, that he needs the help of God to make clear for him. How much more do you and I need clarity from God? We need to pray that God will help us in some way. Some way get through to people. So that they will truly understand. I, I, I hope you pray for me as I'm up here preaching. And I know you do. And I, as I'm down here teaching. I, I hope you pray for our teachers and, and lift them up. This, this is, it, it's difficult when you're teaching in an environment like this because what you want to do is you want to reach people with the message from the youngest age all the way to the oldest age. And that's pretty tough to do. From those who are not even Christians to those who are mature Christians. They've been Christians for years. And so I hope that, that you pray for me, that, that when I stand up here, it will be clear. It will be understood. And that lives will be touched. And they will be changed. But we need to be praying for the church. That we will be effective. That we will have those opportunities. And that when we take advantage of those opportunities... It'll be clear. We need to lift each other up. Let me, let me mention something here in closing. Then I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to challenge you again this morning. Let me, let me just share with you a, a couple of passages. And uh, we'll, we'll come back and talk about this in a few minutes. Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 through 14. Paul writes, Always thanking the Father for you. 
He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. For He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us in, and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul goes on to say, Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received His word from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted it. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which, of course, it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 2 through 3, We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope that you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Peter or Paul rather is doing in all of these letters? He's talking about how much he prays for the church. And his main prayer is this, God, I thank you for the, for the church. How often do you thank God for the church? For your brothers and sisters in Christ and, and what He's doing among His people, Paul says, I thank you for the salvation that the church has received. He says, I thank you that, that the people receive the Word as, as the Word of God, not just mere human ideas. He says, I, I, I thank you, God, for the labor of the church. These people who are faithfully working, serving you. And, and that's one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to, to just every day thank God for His people. And I want to encourage you to lift up their names. We need to be praying for each other. Here's, here's my challenge for you. I'm, I'm done with the lesson. Here's, here's my challenge for you today. Take out another prayer card this morning. And I want you to write down five names of people that you need to pray for this week. Write down five names. You can do that right now. Y'all don't look at me. Grab a card in the pew. Write down five names of people. And I've already mentioned two to you, so I'm making this easy on you. George has got his hand up down here. George said he needs prayers. Put him on your list if you're looking for someone to pray for. And Logan, hey, listen, we need, to, we need to start praying for people. Add five people to your list that you can pray for this week. Last time I did this, this was the cards that was turned in. There's people in this church who ask for prayers for their marriage. There's cards here, people who want to be strengthened spiritually, draw closer to God. There are people who are struggling with work, they're struggling in their finances. There are people who are struggling with their kids. Their kids have rebelled and fallen away from the Lord. But you know what? When we start praying and God starts moving, things start happening. I'll never forget a couple of years ago at Robertsdale, I told them to write down some names of people that you can think of who have not come to Christ. And I want you to give me those names to pray about. I said, you pray about them too. But I said, I want you to give me those names. And I took all those names and, and I put it on a piece of paper front and back. I mean, just wrote all these names out. And we started praying for people who were lost. And it is amazing how many of those people came to Christ. One by one, I was just marking off names. And people were going, I can't believe that. I, I can't believe that person came to Christ. I we got to believe it. God can change hearts. He did Lydia's, right? She's down by the water. Paul and Silas come preaching. And what happens? The Bible says in Acts chapter 16 that the Lord changed her heart. And He can change the heart of those 
that need him. We just need to pray about it. All right, that's, that's my challenge for this week. Pray and pray some more. If you really believe that God is powerful and that prayer moves God, you'll pray. But at this time, if you need to come, we're going to go ahead and extend the invitation. Um, it may be that today you need to come forward and...